I'm Mark DePristo. I, I um, actually now I'm actually co-director of medical genetics. I need to update the, the slide beyond the, the date. Um, in that capacity, I do a variety of things, including run a sequencing informatics group here called um, genome sequencing and analysis. And we develop a variety of tools, called one of which is called the GATK, um, that's, I would say, pretty widely used for next-gen sequencing analysis. And as part of that capacity, you know, we have a lot of expertise in different technologies, different sequencers, um, in particular with an eye toward medical genetic analysis off this data. And so this talk is sort of a, a yearly thing to, to try to bring people up to speed on a variety of different, um, and unfortunately somewhat, um, at best, I guess, orthogonal issues um, in next-gen sequencing. So technology, you know, basic definitions, data representation issues, algorithms, runtimes, things like that. So uh, I've yet, in the three years I've done this, to ever actually reach the end of the talk. So please uh, feel free to, to interrupt and we can discuss things as we go. I try to structure it so that the things at the end are the least important to get to. They're sort of future things that we tend to talk about in MPG. And the earlier stuff is, is very much just a review of, of next-gen sequencing in general. Um, so obviously this is not just my work. There's a lot of people here that are involved in next-gen sequencing. This is sort of a synthesis of a variety of those, um, of, of these people's opinions and work. So I think that at a very high level, the goal is extremely simple. Like after this talk, it'd be good for people to feel like they've more, un they have a greater understanding of the broad picture of next-gen sequencing, not you know the individual analyses that are done for specific projects, but when people say they use a MySeq, what are they talking about? You know, when they say I have 10 lanes of sequencing, what, what exactly does that mean? So I guess it's always useful to start at the very beginning. I mean, you know, it's, it's never really articulated clearly in most, you know, specific project publications. But, you know, the basic question is why is this so exciting? I mean, why do so many people care about this issue? Why do we have companies worth, you know, billions of dollars involved in this space? And the reason for it is simple, is that next-gen sequencing, unlike the initial sequencing that won a variety, uh, actually, I think, two Nobel Prizes, um, it, this is extremely cheap. So with next-gen sequencing, we have the opportunity to truly characterize all the genetic variation in, I have in this slide, thousands of samples. But the reality is this is like millions of samples in the near future. And this is... Different from genotype chips, where I do a discovery of a variety of common SNPs and then, I, or, and then I assay those in each individual. This is really a complete ascertainment, potentially, of all of those samples. So it sort of unlocks a variety of, exper of, of things that you simply could not do in the past. One, you could know everything about any individual sample's genome. Obviously, it's not just pure gen germline genetics that you can do. You can do tumor normals, so you can look at cancer. You can assay things like gene expression levels or methylation. It's a ridiculously broad field because this technology is so enabling. And I think from the perspective, hopefully, of the people in this room, because there's a cancer one of these. Um, so if you're in the room and you want to learn about cancer analysis, you should definitely go also to that talk. This is really focused on the, very, the apparently very simple problem, which is highlighted here, is that this person is a CT heterozygote at this site. You can clearly see that in this IGV screenshot. It's useful to get used to these because you'll see them everywhere now. Um, what that means is you can see that there are these T bases highlighted in the middle on top of these grayed reads. Those reads are what the next-gen sequencer spat out. And some of them are in red Ts because they're not the reference base. And you can see it's perfect, basically, 50-50 heterozygote sampling of reads from each of the two chromosomes. So one is sampling is gray, it's because it's reference C. The other is highlighted in T because it's a non-reference T. So really, much of what I'm going to talk about is simply this overarching goal of what we really want to be able to do is find everything like this very efficiently for many, many samples. And we don't want to do just SNPs. We want to do indels. We want to do structural variants. We want to do rearrangements. You can do inversions, any kind of thing like that. So just to get everyone on the same page, it's useful to start, like, what exactly are we talking about? And I actually used to put this slide later in the talk, but I think it's 
I started using the terminology before we hit the slide. So there are three basic terms that you'll hear people use. There's libraries, there's lanes, and there's flow cells. Although flow cells, you'd also hear the term chips, depending on the technology. I think it's useful just to say, what, what are people talking about? So a library is simply a collection of DNA fragments that are ready for sequencing. So there's this library prep stage that people talk about. You know, obviously, well, I guess not obviously, but you don't just take your sample and stick it on the sequencer. Like you have to prepare the DNA. And this library prep step produces this, these well-characterized sort of size distribution of small DNA fragments that, that actually can go on the sequencer. And libraries can be prepared in many, many different ways. So you can do a single cell. You can amplify your library. So you could PCR it up to take a single cell and have a huge number of molecules from a single individual. You can take a, a big you know, mixture of, of cells, sonicate them, break open the cells, grab a whole bunch of DNA from different cells, merge them together and sequence that. They can have different size distributions. So you could make fragments that are 1,000 bases long, fi 500 bases long, 200 bases long. So these library properties are a, a very big deal for next-gen sequencing, for, in part because things can go horribly, horribly wrong at this stage, because it's a you know, wet lab experiment that doesn't scale like the sequencers do. And it, there's a real expertise in the genomics platform for making these things. So when people say sequencing is being commoditized, what they really mean is that the sequencer is commoditized. That's not the same thing as being able to properly prep DNA. And that's actually an interesting trajectory of the genomics platform. The more you hear about what they talk about, they talk about these sample prep apps that are extremely advanced molecular biology. So the most extreme of this is what are called FFPE samples. These are um, often seen from cancer patients. They're you know, fixed in this parafilm, parafin, and they're horribly degraded. Like if you had to choose something to do to your DNA, you wouldn't do this. Um, and working with that kind of DNA is extremely difficult. So to produce libraries from it is very hard. And that's actually sort of a competitive advantage of the Broad, is the ability to do those things. So given that you've made a library, you then throw it on a thing called a, a flow cell or a chip. And that is a single sort of unit that actually goes through the sequencer in one, day, one run. So people run a flow cell. And it has a variety of lanes. I try to highlight these. These are you know, microfluidic chambers that separate the DNA that go on the same set of, um, on the same actual instrument. And so there are a variety of things that are useful to know about this. One, when people have multiple lanes of sequencing, these can be on the same sequencer. You can also have many flow cells. So you can have a flow cell that you ran you know, yesterday, and then you have a new flow cell today and a different instrument. And maybe you put the same DNA from the same library on a, one of the lanes of that flow cell. So they're really, the flow cell is telling you about what instrument run exactly you did. The lane is telling you about what part of the flow cell you were on. So you can often see that there are concerns. Like people will say things like, the flow cell was contaminated, like lane two and three got mixed. What they're really saying is that like, those two wells somehow cross-talk to each other. So you, you know, put an extra drop of lane one's prep into two on accident, and now one is in two. And they're physically adjacent to each other on the, slide, uh, on the, on the flow cell. So there's all sorts of spatial issues that can happen there. Um, so that's just useful. Lanes and libraries uh, and flow cells, basic sort of discussion units. Another basic unit are reads and fragments. I think it's useful to highlight this. One, these things are, you know, the sequencer spits out short fragments, short reads of DNA. These are like, today they're up to 250 bases on, a, on an aluminum instrument for a pack bio it could be 10,000 bases long. It's an individual sort of observation unit from the machine. And this is sort of, okay, so let's, so, so if you step back, what did the sequencer actually do? to produce that data. So obviously, the thing you're looking at as a read is a sort of artificial construct. That's what the machine tells you it saw. But that's not actually what was on the machine. What's actually on the machine is a fragment of DNA. And there's sort of an inference step from the read to the fragment sequence. And it's useful to think about what this means. So one is you can have many reads that are observations of the same underlying fragment of DNA. So this is what happens when you have duplicate molecules. So if you take a fragment from your library and you do some weird PCR to it, you can get copies of that, of that underlying fragment from your prep, and you can have many reads coming off of it. 
You can also have paired end sequencing. And what this is is saying that I read from both ends of the fragment. So you have two reads reading from the same fragment of DNA. And you may or may not actually observe all the bases in the fragment. So if the, ba if the fragment is 1,000 bases long and you read 100 bases from either side, what you have is effectively read 100 bases, you've skipped 800, and then you have another 100 bases. And the things that you skipped, you don't get to see. But they're from the same underlying fragment of DNA, which is, in principle, sort of only one observation of the chromosome. And the reason for this is you know, it, it turns out to be a big issue if you have reads, for instance, that overlap. So they're read pairs, and they read across each other. You only read, you have two observations of the same underlying thing that may or may not correspond perfectly to the sampling of a diploid organism's chromosomes. So this is actually a little tricky, but it can, it can really lead things horribly awry if you don't appreciate that the observations are different from the things that are sequenced. Because you can have, uh, you can have very different sampling properties from the chromosomes to the fragments to the reads. So I know that's sort of horribly technical, but it's actually extremely interesting and important. Um, in fact, you can see actually the observation of this. I, I, in this slide, that I highlight in, in purple frag reads from the same fragment. So you read two reads, one from each direction of the fragment, one from the, the forward strand, one on the reverse. And those reads overlap in the middle here. And you can see they agree on the T. And they agree on the T because they have to. They're, it's the same thing you read twice. So jumping way, way up in scale, this is a, a nice chart of very recently of what are the Broad's production sequencing capacity. So when you go do sequencing here, what, what instruments is it running on? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so the Broad, I, maybe I'll just say that so everyone is on the, on the same page. So the Broad does what, what actually I thought for a long time was called sparkle multiplexing, but it's actually sprinkle multiplexing. Um, I actually prefer sparkle multiplexing, personally. But what they do is if you're, you can put an identifier in your DNA. I think it's like six bases today. And that barcode of, of DNA allows you to identify a sample. And if you put these barcodes on, you can basically mix DNA together and sequence lots of individuals on the same lane. So the Broad, in order to avoid this sort of catastrophic failure, where you, know, you have a big project, you do 100 samples. And if the failure rate of a lane is 1%, it's not, but suppose it is, and you do a one lane per sample, then your project gets 99% of the way done, and you have one thing that blocks the whole project. So instead of going, we moved about a year and a half ago, I think, to this sprinkle multiplexing, where what you do instead is barcode everyone, put them in a big pool, and then put the pool of all the mixed people on all 100 lanes. And so your sample is actually run on 100 lanes. And so that one failure just reduces your overall coverage by 1%, which is not a catastrophic failure for a project. The effects of that on your sample quality, as far as we can tell, are pretty minimal. There's some minor concerns that. You don't have that much data per sample per lane to build you know, really good error models or something like that. But it's never been a, we've never observed such a big problem. And it's par partially just simply the fact that you still produce a, a hell of a lot of data, even, per, even when you sprinkle multiplex in a single lane. The lanes are just so productive compared to what they used to be that what was fine, you know, what was OK to do on one lane three years ago is sort of already at a hundredth of the productivity of a current lane. So it's sort of, we were happy three years ago, we're happy today for exactly that reason. OK. So the Broad has currently got a variety of sequencers. You know, there's the workhorse instruments, which are these HiSeq 2000s. There are 51 of these. There are these MySeqs that people are sort of, I think, very, they're very interesting instruments. They're very exciting for a variety of reasons. One is that um, they're very, very fast. So a HiSeq run, on average, takes about two weeks. So when you do squirt that DNA on two weeks later, you get some data. The MySeqs run overnight. So they're much more expensive per base, but they're very, very fast. So there's this idea, if you really want to know the answer to something, you can do it quickly. You couldn't do that on a HiSeq. We also have a variety of tech dev um, systems. We have an ion torrent system. So this is currently PGMs, but soon there'll be protons. 
And these are an orthogonal sequencing technology, but relatively scalable and also nearly price competitive with Illumina. And then there's this PacBio RS instrument, which is lower on the lower right here. It's really grossly not to scale. This machine is ridiculously huge. Um, I believe they had to reinforce the floors in uh, the genomics platform to bring it, actually bring it in. It was going to collapse through the ground. Um, it is extremely interesting because it does single molecule observations. It produces very, very long reads. It's just currently quite expensive for each one of those bases. So to give you an idea of how much sequencing, you know, why is this so exciting? So I would say on the left, upper left is the most interesting thing. These are human whole exomes produced by the Broad every quarter. And on the Q4 2012, we have, I think this has got to be cumulative, to be fair. Um, we have nearly 60,000 exomes sequenced here already. So you can see these things are just shooting up. We have many, many whole genomes, but not nearly as many. And the total productivity of the sequencing center is a, tr uh, that's a billion, billion bases. So it's kind of ridiculously productive. There are very few s technologies that would be able to scale at that kind of rate. It's you know, beyond Moore's law. There's all sorts of things that you can show. But it really is an amazingly productive um, technology. There's these things called high seq 2000s. It's the workhorse. It produces reasonably long bases. I don't know why they even itemize 25 bases. I mean, I guess you could do that, but it seems strange. It produces an enormously large amount of data, 600 gigabases per run. The run takes two weeks. Uh, actually, here, the, I guess the runs have gone down a little bit. Here they say 10 days on average. Um, MySeq, as you can see, is a little less productive. It's like a couple of gigabases per run versus 600 gigabases per run. But it's running in one day, which is a very attractive feature. And they use this for a variety of things. Projects in a hurry, I think, is probably the best description. There's ion torrents. These are interesting technology. I'm going to skip over at the little. Uh, there we go. I'll just say basic thing. It's actually it's very interesting technology because it's on a it's a semiconductor based sequencer. So even though the sequencing productivity is scaling faster than Moore's law, we're still way the hell behind Moore's law. So Moore's law has been scaling for 40 years. We've been scaling for like 10. So they're still they still have a huge leg up on us in terms of you know density of of well, density of transistors uh, per unit area. So these guys actually do sequencing by building semiconductor-based um, probes and then flowing DNA over this. And what they, this allows them to do is, is sort of jump on the capabilities of the semiconductor industry and scale chips out very, very easily. So it's kind of like a Pentium chip, you know, way back in the day today. But you know, if you can reach the, the current sequence, certain um, chip architectures of today, you know, you could scale to billions of probes, which would let you have an enormously productive sequencer. So it's on this very efficient trajectory of, of generating a lot of data for very, very little cost in, in principle in the future. Uh, ion torrents have this chip designation because, again, it's a, it's a semiconductor chip. It's producing actually quite long reads, you know, 100 to 400 bases. It runs very, very quickly, so on the order of hours. This is, is kind of interesting, even more productive than a MySeq. Um, it has, like with many of the life, life tech systems, very difficult PCR sample prep. So this has sort of always been a, a challenge with life tech things is to get this is partly solved. Um, it's very hard to get this to work, apparently. It's a sort of a, a, a dark art. OK, does anyone have any questions on that? Go ahead. I think the Broad's position is that we care about two completely orthogonal things. One is we really care about having a capacity that's very, very fast. So things like the MySeq or the Ion Torrent are very attractive like this. You know, I come in, we have an interesting finding, I want to publish my paper. You come over, you can get some small experiment done quickly. Then there's this other question that's is I want to pay as little as possible for big projects. So if I want to sequence 50,000 people, I'm extremely cost sensitive. So what I don't care about is turnaround. What I care about is cost. And the, the low latency market is pretty competitive, I would say. There's MySeqs and IONS are, are 
they're interesting. They're both like reasonable choices in this space. There is no competitor to the to an Illumina high seek in the high in the low cost market. So Life is coming out with a thing called a Proton, but it's not really cost competitive yet. There's a Proton 2 projected that's supposed to be cost competitive. So I don't until there's some competitor that's actually cost competitive at scale, I think most sequencing data will be produced with Illumina instruments. But that's not to say that most interesting experiments are going to be done with the Illumina instruments. There's going to be a lot of work in these sort of very fast turnaround things. Yep. Yeah, we have many, many thousands of these, actually. We have, yes. Actually, I'm surprised it's so low. We have, actually, it's funny. Whole to be honest, whole genome, deep whole genomes are actually not so useful. I mean, it sounds kind of funny, but like, it is the case that there's a, some number of deep whole genomes in cancer that are very interesting, but they're a small fraction. There's many out there in the world, and people are often trying to find people who will simply analyze them. And it's, it's a bit of a difficult situation. It's a ridiculously large data type. And it's, it's not, because the N is small, it's, there's not much you can do with it. This, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, we have, a we, we have a data set that we put together for the CU trio, this is NA1278 and others, that are, each one of those samples is like 100x. No, no, like they're all sequenced here, not, not cumulatively, that's like a, a particular experiment, and we have enormously large, I mean, that's just arbitrary, that cutoff of 100x, that was us like aggregating data. We could make a data set for NA1278 that's like 1,000x easily, whole genome. Um, because we routinely get emails saying, I have a PCR-free 30x whole genome of anyone to its own. Do you want to look at it? I mean, it's just not hard to make. The problem is you would prefer, given a fixed budget in MPG, to make to do exomes or low-pass because you just get more samples. Yeah, but, I mean, some of our algorithms, though, right, it would be really nice to have super, super Right. This is why we have this yeah, data set, and it's publicly available on 1,000 genomes. We push it up there for exactly this reason. In fact, Ami, who's sitting there, does an enormous amount of computational work on this sample. You had a question, too? Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah. It does in some sense. Again, one of the things that's funny about error rates is, like, there's this marketing thing that everyone has, like, is in this giant pissing contest over, you know, error rates of their instruments, but this is really an irrelevant issue. Like, what really you care about is whether the error is systematic or not. Like, I could, like, a coin flip is ridiculously errorful. It's as bad as it gets, but it's totally fine for any kind of statistical analysis because I exactly know how it flips. The problem with the sequencers has nothing to do with their error rates. It's entirely a fact that the things are, have cr crazy complex error modes that are very hard to ca characterize. So, like, the most extreme of this is PacBio. PacBio has a ridiculously high error rate. It's like 10%, but it's beautifully stochastic. So it's extremely easy to work with as a data type because you just get more data. Like I know how to, I know how to handle stochastic error. So most of these sequencers have similar error rates, but what really we spend all our time worrying about is the degree to which the error model is complicated or not. And both of the sequencers have hideously complicated the big, big ones, Life and, and Illumina, have hideously complicated error processes. And modeling that and handling it is, is like 50% of what my group does because it's so hideously complicated. Any other questions? All right, move on. Um, so just thinking a little bit through the space of you know, op experimental designs, you know, there's a variety of places you can end up in this figure. The sort of fundamental trade-off is the number of samples versus the depth of the sequencing, because that's just cost. And there are people have ended up all over the place on this figure. So there are some projects that have gone low-pass whole genome. So this is 1,000 genomes has this design, type 2 diabetes. This is very interesting if, what you, want, if you want to maximize the number of samples and the number of common variants that you can find. 
because you're trading off sort of depth per sample, so you know less about each one, but you have many more samples. So for every, you know, if you had 40x design versus a 4x design, you could have 10 times more samples for approximately the same cost. You know, the other side of this is the deep single genomes. This is in cancer, where that's really, you know, the samples are quite limited. They're extremely valuable individually. And so there's, it makes sense to spend more money. And then there's also much more complicated things going on genome-wide, you know, rearrangements, inversions. And so you're really getting a lot of bang for your buck there. There's a many, most sequencing projects of the Broad has showed up in this middle, which is the exome sequencing projects, ESP, autism. These are a small region of the genome. It's very, it's much, it's extremely deep. It's actually deeper, to be fair, than the single deep genomes. It's like 150x. But you can do a lot of samples because it's much, much cheaper. And then finally, there are these like ridiculous lead deep candidate gene follow-up studies where you know you capture 10 genes or 100 genes and because of the productivity of sequencer you get 10,000 x per sample or something unreasonable um, and those data types are also floating around and people choose a variety of where they want to end up here in some sense trading power for discovery and association versus completeness of the characterization of each individual sample um, there's hybrid selection. This is the approach to capture regions of the genome. There's a nice paper if you want to read the details. Um, it's really relatively straightforward. You hybridize a bait. You, you design sequences that are complementary to what you want to capture. You synthesize those, put them on some beads, put them in uh, the library that you've made, pull out the fragments that match them, and then you sequence that. Um, there's a huge number, a huge variety of, of, of capture technologies, but that's all fundamentally what they do. Um, indexed hybrid capture is just this fact that people put barcodes on the sequence. So when they say that you, when people say they have an indexed capture or something like that, what they're really saying is they added barcodes to their samples so they could do the sparkle um, sequencing. So moving somewhat into analysis in terms of the trade-off of what's going on, and I think it's not, it certainly wasn't a pre, very well appreciated um, before, say, thousand genomes came along and started doing this, was that. There's a, there is isn't a clear trade-off between the efficiency of discovering variants in a population versus effect, you know, completeness in per sample. I mean, it seems kind of obvious when you say it like that. But the, the, I think this is a good example here. On the left, you have a deep single genome. So you have very good characterization of the three variants that are in that person. So you have two hats and a homozygous site in the stars. Taking the same sequencing data, I can divide it up among four samples, including sample one, and I miss the het on the right due to sampling problems. Right? In, sam in sample one, I don't have enough depth to guarantee I see it. But of course, on the trade-off of that, I see this, that very same site in another sample because most sites are common, so I can easily find common sites. And in general, I find more variants with this approach. So. As long as I'm willing to lose characterization per sample, I get actually an ag I'm more efficient at finding common variation through a, a low depth of design. So some people sort of take this to the extreme and want to do like one read sample sequencing of, of as many people as possible. And that has the advantage that you just very, very efficiently find all the, the variation in, a, in the samples. OK? So, Here's the high pass design, some basic things. Suppose I did do a whole deep genome of a ger this is germline in particular. You're targeting around 3 billion bases. It's about the size of the human genome. You know, you're averaging uh, something like 30x. This is the standard. You see this is requiring on the order of 100 gigabases of data, potentially more. It takes all eight lanes of a high seek. Uh, oh, actually, this slide is slightly out of date. It takes one and a half lanes now. You find on order three to five million SNPs, another sort of half a million indels in that sample. And your power to do everything is sort of above 99%. You find almost everything, um, everything that's even a singleton in the sample you find all with the basically exactly the same power. This is one reason it's a compelling design because you just get 99% of everything. You do this, of course, by wasting a ton of money. The low pass design is similar to the high pass design. It's a whole genome design. You get everything around, but you need much, much less data. So you need like fivefold less data. 
you find on order of three million, maybe you find five million, depending on how you do this, you find something like 90% of the variation in their genome, you're just gonna miss things due to sampling. Um, the power to discover singletons is pretty poor. So if you have a true singleton, i.e. across your n samples you've sequenced, the chance to see that is not great. It's like 50%. But for everything that's common, you get, you get you have 99% power. So if that's what you care about, common variation, and I think it's useful to say, why do people, why do people actually do this? And it's simply because at the end of the day, if you want to do association studies, you want to actually make any sense of your, your samples. If, well, I say it like this, maybe not say make sense, but if you, if you want to look for variation that's associated with a disease, so you have to do some sort of statistical analysis, singletons are pretty useless because they're by definition only occurring once in that sample. So the best you can hope to do is somehow sum them up in some way like with a burden test. But there's no association statistic you can do on a zero one count even with enormous n. This just doesn't work. So it makes sense to have designs that let you have more samples because the thing that's zero, zero, 01 case control, if you can do 10 times more people and it's zero, 010, this is starting to become interesting. But there's tons and tons of sites that are zero, 01 just from sampling. So until you get, you gotta pass by the sampling issues with the number of samples to start to do any statistics unless you get lucky with a burden test, in which case like you have some sum of singletons. And sometimes we see this, this is what they saw in autism sequencing exomes, but it's not the most efficient design unless you really think that that's exactly the, the strategy. And, and all those projects that I know of all went the exome design because they wanted more samples anyway, so they just captured less of the genome. So deep whole genomes, a thousand of these things are pretty useless for association statistics, unless you're cancer in which case you have, you have to do this. So exome capture, very simple. It's a trade-off of target area for coverage. So instead of going whole genome and instead of going shallow, what you're doing is you're capturing just the exons. So whether or not this is such a great thing given how many GWAS hits are outside of genes, it's not, it's not clear. Um, but it's extremely good at finding all the variation within an exome because it's so cheap you can do many, many samples. And so this is a sort of a very reasonable thing to do while we wait for, say, whole deep genomes to become so cheap that we just do those instead of capturing, in which case you'll just do your analysis there. Um, OK, good. Do people have questions on the sort of experimental design section? Go ahead. You mean in sense, what is your estimated allele frequency given the experiment? Yeah, so I think in principle, there's a, there, my only saying again, you guys have become obsessed with statistical inference. So my answers are always like this, is that there is, there exists some true allele frequency in the pop, in the set of samples that you sequenced, right? And, and there's some sort of sample from a true population frequency. So you have, you have a, given even substantial missing data, you can compute accurately your, estimated allele frequency in the true population, even with almost no data per sample. And the algorithms to do that are all instantiating things like the GATK or basically all analysis algorithms are able to do this. So there really should not be any substantial difference in the allele frequency estimates because everything is done statistically. It's not like you're counting. You're not counting genotypes. You're really basing this on the data. What is the probability distribution of the true allele frequency given my data? And it's very, very efficiently converging on the right answer. Is that answering your question or no? These are in general almost exactly on. So the, the best plot I've ever seen of this is ESP versus autism sequencing for exomes and it's like straight on the line, the estimated frequencies. But 
in general, you can do ridiculously sophisticated things with just the statistical est estimates of the allele frequency. So if, if you really want to dive into that, I would talk to Hong Lee, who's computed things that are you know, very interesting based on 4x data and the posterior distribution of the expected allele frequency across all the samples. So it can be done extremely accurately, and it's consistent if done well across lots of projects. And that's just because you're estimating something that's real. You know, you're not calculating in your sample. You're estimating this true allele frequency given data, and, and that tends to converge extremely effectively if you do it right. Good. All right. So um, I guess one question for everyone, given that we have 20 minutes left, do people want to hear more about data processing algorithms or more about quality control? How do you know that it went well? Obviously, I'm biased toward doing the algorithms because this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. But the quality control stuff is probably more relevant to people because you know, you're not generally writing methods for next-gen sequencing analysis, but it's useful to appreciate like, how to assess quality. So what I'll do is basically say very simply that there are, these slides are available online for everyone who wants to look at the data processing pipelines. Suffice to say that the, the workflow that we developed in sort of 2010 is, and I think now, gold standard. Everyone does this. Um, everything is sort of a variation on this theme of like processing your data per sample, joining up all the sa sample data to compute all the sites that are likely polymorphic, and then bringing in lots of external data to try to sort out the artifacts from the real variation. And there's lots of tools to do this, and some of them we write. So I'll just jump over this for everyone who's interested. Um, da, da. This is actually a useful thing to point out, because this is one of the new slides. And I finally put together a slide to say, what is the ideal product of a next-gen sequencing project? So it's not the case that your ideal product is like the cause in a sample. Right? What your ideal product is, is for all the sites that are polymorphic of any type in your end samples that you're, are part of your project, what is what are the genotypes and the confidences in those genotypes for all samples? And the reason for this is simple. Like, If something is a singleton in your sample and you've done single sample analysis, you don't know whether, you don't know the confidence at which it is definitely not present in the other samples. And that term dominates very quickly. So, you know, what was once complete genomics is they went through this enormous problem of being single sample oriented. And you can have a very low false positive rate per sample. You can have lots of, you know, lots of good calls. But then you take a huge pedigree of samples and you do things like Mendelian violation analysis. And you're completely dominated by the effect of not properly assaying all the reference sites in the other people. Because the statement of being de novo is something of saying it's present in the child and confidently absent in the, in the parent. And the confidence on that needs to be enormous. It needs to be like 10 to the 8 confidence, because the rate at which de novo mutations occur is, is sort of there's 30 per genome. And so if you don't think of your, the, the goal of your project as being a complete matrix of all sites by all samples, everything you need to know about the likelihoods and the genotypes, most of the analyses you want to do that are based on contrastive features between sets of samples will be dominated by the inaccuracies or lack of ascertainment of lots of, of in parts of the subsets of the samples. And so it's very, very important to get to this matrix. It's the reason that we're obsessed with multi-sample calling and the Broad is always doing everything jointly. Because there's no real way to analyze things without knowing accurately how well you knew that a site was referenced at a site of interest in another sample. Like you're just never going to make progress without those estimates. And they have to be good, or else you're dominated by error in rare events. So, so are you telling me you need to add new samples and have to run it for every for all the samples? This is what we do now. So the algorithms are so fast that you know we're we're now doing this project with Daniel MacArthur to call 25,000 exomes simultaneously. That's another thing that AMI is working on. Um, this is pretty fast. Faster, certainly, than spending a lot of time trying to sort it out on the back end. So it's just not that much data. And so we spend a lot of time fighting our way through making these things fast. I think it would probably be a couple thousand CPU days. So this is very, very, this is very cheap, actually, because a CPU day is like $3.
So you're talking about for a project paying five or six thousand dollars to have a unified product at the end, and if you have twenty five thousand samples, you paid, you know, an, well over a million dollars to generate the data. So you're talking about a marginal additional cost at the end. Go ahead. Yeah, that's exactly right. So the example I would give is, suppose you want to know that a site is rare. This is a classic problem in like Mendelian. If, if you want to, suppose you're trying to do Mendelian disease diagnosis. The current workflow looks something like, I sequence my sample. Maybe I get to the parents. Then if, I'm, if I have the parents, maybe I can do some linkage. Maybe I can do something you know, classical. But suppose I don't. Often you don't. The standard thing people do is like intersect the calls with dbSNP and like try to get frequency estimates from 1,000 genomes. But the much better thing to do is, in fact, to add that sample to, say, hundreds of thousands of other samples so that when you call like a rare indel in that sample, you know the confidence at which it is truly unique to that sample by having assayed it in all the other people. That's, that is, it gives you an internal project control. <coughs> for the frequency. And that's, again, our view is to make that as easy as possible. And we would really like every single sample that ever gets produced to be recalled in aggregate with all existing samples. So you can truly know the frequency of the variance. And uh, would, the, uh, would the researchers have access to the unified stuff? Would you say that my rare indel was found in other samples? Would I know what unified? You could. If this was structured correctly, you could, right? So it's a question of how broadly consented the, sam the other samples are, and how well those phenotypes are captured by some system that looks like that. But many samples are broadly consented. DB, DB Gap is currently working to release on the order of like 30 or 40,000 raw genome sequences for broadly consented samples. So those have phenotypes and sequencing data. So you could pro today, if we could just get all the data together and sort out these. Uh, consent issues, we could have 50,000 common controls with relatively rich phenotypes. And then you could know, for instance, it would be very interesting to know if your sample is rare and has shares a single, it shares an indel with another sample, whether that sample had a phenotype compatible with yours. <coughs> All right. That was useful to stop there. Okay. So I'm just going to keep skipping over file formats for anyone who wants to know. So why don't we talk about quality control? What, you know, how do you know? Suppose somebody gave you some calls from next gen sequencing. How do you know they're good? You know, what do we look for? So, the first thing that I, I would always look for is the number of calls. And this is a per sample value. You want to see the distribution of the number of calls per person. So, an exome should have on the order of 20 some thousand calls. If you're outside of that bound, something has gone horribly wrong. So either the capture isn't working, somebody's caller is busted, a variety of things. Like that's the first smell test. If you have genotype chip data, this is good. It's in terms of assessing the accuracy of the genotypes. Good sequencing data today should be above 95, 99% concordance to chips. If it's not, it's almost always because your samples are contaminated or they've been swapped, or something like that. So if it doesn't go above that value and you don't have reason, and, and it's not like a 4x design, you should be worried. In fact, you know, the sequencing data is really much better than chips. The reason it doesn't go above 99.5 is the chip is only accurate to 1 in 200 places. Um, however, this is not a measure, just to be clear, not a measure of accuracy of the calls. It's a measure of genotyping quality. So I can do incredibly well at sites that are known to be polymorphic because they're easy. And I can still have a ton of false positives because those are novel sites. They're not going to be on your chip. It's very rare that people make chips with tons of false positives. Um, a good measure of potential at error rate in the novel calls is this: how, what fraction of sites are in dbSNP. If you're comparing to a new version of dbSNP that includes 1,000 genomes, this should be above 99%. I mean, basically, phase 1,000 genomes brings the catalog per sample above to nearly 99% for any ethnicity. 
And so if you see that your DB SNP rate is like 95%, this should worry you substantially. Because that's a pretty low rate if 99% of all the stuff is known. So just good quality control. It's, and it's not so easy to reach that. Another good metric is this transition to transversion rate. Um, there's a nice description of how this works in our paper, but it is a good proxy for error rate, simply because if you make random errors, they tend not to be consistent with this extremely biased true mutational process in humans. And, that, and that'll, that's a bit of a, a red flag. Here's some basic information about how many calls you should expect, depending on the different type of, of design. It's just reference more than anything. Here's the 1,000 genomes is 99%. You can see if you take, this is a function of DB SNP ID. So some point, you know, IDs correspond to date. You can see the catalog as 1,000 genomes came in. The phase one catalog brought the number of variants up enormously, and it pushed the fraction of novel variants, even in a, you know, African ancestry genome to something like 2 or 2 to 1%. So this is a whole genome. For an exome, it's even better. So just as a caveat, though, you have to know the dbSNP build. As you can see, it varies enormously by what version of dbSNP you're comparing to. If you compare to one that's even four years old, you'd be up at like 20%. I'll just skip over this. So one, a big active area of research that I think is useful to talk through is indels are ridiculously hard. And they're ridiculously hard for a variety of reasons. One is that, I guess I say, you have to think about why would this be hard? It would be hard for a variety of reasons. One is that you don't know what the allele is. You have to figure this out from the data. So a SNP is kind of trivial, right? It's a base. You know the reference base. It has to be one of the other three. So you can just sort of enumerate up front all the possibilities. But for an indel, you don't know. There's no way to know whether it's a one base pair insertion, a two base pair insertion, is it a three base pair deletion. The only possible way to do that is actually look at the data and try to infer simultaneously the allele and then the genotypes. So it's, it's a much harder problem. Also, sequencing data, as the, allele, as the indel gets longer, it starts to represent a large fraction of the actual read. So a 20 base pair insertion is like 20% of the data of a single read. And so it has a tendency to sort of kick reads out. It can be very difficult for that read to map to that location. So you start to lose data. And then worse, to make it even worse, the regions where indels occur commonly are often repetitive. I mean, that's, the very, that's why there tends to be length polymorphism there. They're in like trinucleotide repeats or and so even well-mapped reads often don't span across the event. So even reads that are there are often not so informative. So if, I have, if I'm trying to sequence a gene and it has a huge uh, asparagine repeat in it that's like 20 amino acids long, I have to cross at least 60 bases to know the length of that event. So I can have almost no information, even from all the reads that map there, on actually what the true allele is. And that tends to drive an enormous amount of, of difficulty with indels. Yep? We do, yeah, it does. The, the example I, I can think of that is the most interesting of this is that one of the things we really like about these long MySeq reads that are 2, two by 250s is that you can start to see that what you think are small events are large events. So we have a good example of a validation site in 1,000 genomes. It was an indel call. It was short. It looks like it validates on a high seq. So you resequence with a high seq. It looks like the event is there. But when you go onto my seq, you realize that what you're looking at is the breakpoint of like a 750 base pair event. And you can only, you only see this because you have enough data to, to see that there's some anomalous behavior. But the region is quite repetitive, and, and the breakpoints tend to be similar to each other. So it, it, it's this, this, you do start to see this with longer data. I mean, one thing that we're very interested in is characterizing that value. How much better do you get at indel calling as you have longer reads? Um, so 
I think there's, this is very hard to know how good your indole call set is. There's substantial disagreement with how many indoles are in an average exome. This goes all the way from like papers that say there are 200 to 300 to we make call sets for ESP where we think we find 500. And that's a, that's a big difference. I mean, this is, a, you know, two, threefold differences. And it's not obvious who's right because it's very hard to validate these things. So you get this example I was talking about. You look like you can confirm the event as being small, but this is only because the validation technology is inadequate. So we really have a hard time with this. One thing that's useful to appreciate is that the number of indels goes down as a function of the, con the degree of conservation of a coding region. So if you take CCDS, this is quite different from like a very general ref seek definition because you're including more or less well conserved genes, and those genes are more rich for indels. So if you take the most conserved set of genes, and you ask how many indels are in those, and then I say, well, I'm going to take everything within 50 bases of them, you go from like 400 indels to like 1,000 indels per sample by adding 20% you know, of the area. Because as soon as you step out of those highly conserved coding regions, you're in introns, and the rate goes astronomically high. So it's very hard to know what this means. There's certainly one thing that's useful is that you wouldn't expect to see too many out of frame events. But still, it's got to be, it's a, the lowest estimates I've ever seen is that something like 40% of all the indels are frame shifting. Nobody claims that it's 10%. But it could be as high as 50%. It's just not clear. The other thing that makes this monstrously difficult is that across samples, there's heterogeneity in the allele. So one thing that's nice is that you know, SNPs are almost always old, and they almost always are biallelic. So you have some ancient event, it segregates, it's got the high frequency, so you see it in a lot of people. Many indel events have many, they're, they're, hot, they're mutational hotspots. So in thousands of samples, there'll be three or four different actual lengths of the, the sequence where the indels are occurring. And so this is very, very difficult. So now you, you know, have much less power per sample because each sample is actually substantially different from each other. Um, the best thing that we do is just to try to get a feel for this is that if you do the same sequencing experiment on many samples, your answer should be consistent across the samples. So whatever you look for in any of these metrics, like what's the length distribution, how many indels are there per sample, what you really want to see is that the number is consistent across all, all your samples. Because if it's not, this is this is, you know that you're in, you have an enormous number of technical issues because your samples are fundamentally all the same. It's all human germline. Samples, all the muta almost all the mutations are segregating old things. So it shouldn't be the case that one sample has 200 indels and another has 1,000. This is just totally unreasonable. And yet this is very easy to see in many indel call sets. Good. So in the interest of time, um, I'm happy to just take some basic questions because people are starting to line up for the MPG thing. So do people have questions, things they want to talk through a little bit? People want to just get coffee? Go ahead. Yeah. You mean you, you think that the number of in frame events should be much lower? Right. I think this is really common, but you know, for instance, in a luminous sequencer, the one percent, the one base pair events are a common error mode. So I'm happy to talk afterward. I think people are coming in, so I think it's good. We'll we'll retire. <laughs>